With the release of Blender 4.2, we need to upgrade our add-ons to Blender extensions to be able to use the new features of this release. For example, allowing developers to update their add-ons and users of those add-ons would just press a single button from Blender's UI to get that update. In this video, I'll go over the main changes that you need to make to your legacy add-on to turn it into an extension. If you're new here, I'm Victor Stepanoff and I love helping artists learn the Python programming language. As you go through this video and things are not making sense, make sure to ask your question in the comments. The simpler your add-on, the fewer changes you'll need to make to transform your add-on into an extension. Let's start with the very first thing that everyone would need to change, and that is moving the met metadata from the BLInfo dictionary into a new file specially dedicated for this metadata. It's called Blender Manifest Toml. The names of the BL Info Dictionary fields and the Blender Manifest Toml don't match exactly, but most will be self-explanatory. A number of fields in this manifest are required. Fields like name, tagline, and maintainer, along with other fields. One of the new fields here is the license field, and you'll need to specify that to communicate under what license the code of your add-on will be distributed. There are other fields in this Blender Manifest Toml, but they are optional, and I'll touch on some of them later in the video. Next, you'll need to make sure that all of your imports are relative. Some of the add-on developers are already using these, and you might not need to do anything here. So how would you know that you need to do something here? Well, in your import statements of other Python files or modules in your add-on, you'll be referencing the add-on name to get to the other module. And with this requirement, you need to replace that with the dot notation communicating where that other module is in relative to the file that you're looking at. Now, if this doesn't make a lot of sense, it's easier to show than to tell. I'll be also making a separate video that I will be linking in the description on this particular topic, so don't worry. Let's take a look at an example of what an add-on developer needed to do to satisfy this requirement. So here I'm looking at MMD tools, and this is a diff if you have never seen one, basically this red with minuses shows what was in the file before a change was made and the green and the pluses shows what changes the developer did. And you can see that they used to be, uh, they used to use uh, the name of the add-on in their import and they replaced it with these dots uh, indicating a relative import. Now let's take a look at, for example, uh, this exceptions. So before it was under the add-on, core, and then exceptions. Notice that we're looking at the materials.py in the core folder. Now see that exceptions is also in the same core folder, and that is why you only add one single dot, which means in the same folder as this particular file. Now let's take a look at the other example, which is BPY utils. Now you can see here before it was just the name of the add-on uh, and the module. This means that it was right in the root of the add-on. Since the materials.py is in a folder, we need to provide one and then two dots, so one, two, to kind of get into the root of the add-on. So I hope this makes a bit more sense. I'll add a link to this particular change so you can, so you can take a look for yourself. With all of the relative imports fixed, now let's find all the places in your add-on where, where you reference it by name and replace that with double underscore package double underscore. I found another change that another developer did and you can see how they replaced this bulk asset name, which is the name of this particular add-on with the double underscore package. One of the main requirements of an extension is that it needs to be self-contained, meaning that all the code that your add-on needs needs to be packaged with your add-on. Just like packing for a trip to a very remote location, you would make sure to get everything that you need so you won't be relying on anyone else. This is the biggest change that add-on developers would need to do if they are depending on third-party Python packages. The Blender developers have outlined three main ways how you can package third-party code with your add-on. One of the ways they've outlined is using the vendoring Python package, which is able to pack small pure Python dependencies with your add-on. Now, the key word here is pure Python dependencies, and this is a whole separate topic, but I can give you an analogy of what this means. Pure Python packages 
are packages that have only Python code. Think of it as creating a 3D model using only Blender tools to sculpt, add a shader and rig using only what Blender provides. Now, there are other Python packages that are using not only Python code, but some C, C++ code. And in our analogy, this would be similar to making some textures in Photoshop, maybe making a simulation in Houdini and importing all that into your final scene in Blender. This vendoring tool only works for the packages that are exclusively written in Python and that you can install using pip from the Python package index. To make this vendoring work, you would need to first, of course, install the vendoring Python package. Next, you would need to create a special file that would define the location of where the vendor folder would go and define the names of the small pure Python packages that your add-on depends on. After that's set up, you can run the command. This will automatically download the packages into the vendor folder that you've provided. To use these packages in this vendor folder, you would use a relative import like this. You don't have to put only Python packages that you can install from pip into that folder. You can also put code that wasn't written by you into this folder and that code might not be available on the Python package index and you can install it with pip. A great example of this is Curtis Holt's EasyBPY package that contains a ton of great utilities for developing your add-ons. I've also seen people add code snippets from Stack Overflow and reference where they got those code snippets. If you wanna see how a simple extension would look using the vendorized package, I've created an example that I'll link in the comments. The primary way that Blender developers would recommend distributing these Python dependencies is using Python wheels. Now, Python wheels are the standard way of distributing Python packages, and you can see if a Python package provides these Python wheels in the Python package index page for a given package under download files, build distribution. Now, some Python packages have just one wheel file, while others will have multiple. And usually the pure Python packages will only have a single wheel file. And this is another way that you can install those if you don't like the vendorizing technique. The Python packages that have multiple wheel files are packages that contain some kind of code that needs to be built. For example, C or C++. And you would have a wheel file for each platform that this Python package supports. And by platform, I mean OS plus architecture combination. This is a deep topic regarding why each platform requires its own wheel file. But the short explanation is an analogy to what Blender does. Blender is written in C and C++, and it has separate installers for every single operating system that it supports. Similar here, the Python packages that have C and C++ parts will need to have their own Python wheel files built specifically for a given platform. To get the right wheel files, you would use the following command. You would need to run this command from the command line in the folder where your add-on is located. If you're not familiar with running things from the command line, I have made a separate video going over how you can run things from the command line, and I will leave a link in the description. You can see that this command is using the pip program, which usually comes with a standalone install of Python. If you don't have a standalone install of Python on your operating system, I would recommend that you would install it. If you don't know how, I have another separate video describing how you can do this as well. And I'll also leave a link in the description. There are a number of places in this command that you would need to fill out with your own information. So the very first thing is what Python version Blender is running. You can find this information in the scripting workspace in the Python console. At the time of the recording, that Python version was 3.11. You'll also need to check what platforms the Python package that you need supports. It is important to understand that not all Python packages support every single platform. The following platforms will cover 99% of your use cases, and most major Python packages usually support these platforms. So before running the pip command for a given platform, make sure to check in the download files build distribution that the wheel files for those platforms actually exist. If a wheel file for a platform that you're looking for does not exist, this potentially means that your extension won't be able to support that platform unless you find 
a replacement Python package. Now you can run the command and after you do that, you'll find the wheel files in the folder that you have specified. When downloading one of the Python wheels, you might find that it would download more than one wheel file. And that's because Python packages depend on other Python packages. And the pip download command will automatically find those dependencies and grab the wheel files for those dependencies as well. After you have all those wheel files downloaded, make sure to update your Blender Manifest Toml with the paths to those wheel files. And also make sure to specify the platforms that your extension supports. By the way, you can use the Blender extension build command to create zip archives for each platform that your extension supports. This is done to reduce the size of each one of those zip files for each platform because you won't be bundling wheel files that won't be used on a given platform. Great example of how you can organize the wheel files you can find in a extension called Molecular Nodes and I will leave a link in the comments for you to check that out. And the final way that you can bundle code with your extension is by bundling other add-ons that your add-on depends on. And I have created an example extension for you to take a look and I'll link it in the description. Some things to keep in mind here is that only the top or parent add-on will be registered in the preferences UI. The classes for the other add-ons or secondary add-ons will be registered but they won't get their own UI elements in the preferences so you won't be able to enable or disable them unless you disable the whole add-on. At the time of this recording this wasn't stated in the documentation but I was able to confirm this information with the Blender developers. Also when you include a dependency add-on don't include the Blender manifest file for that add-on. You should only have one single Blender manifest toml for your primary add-on. When bundling add-ons together you should take extra care when supporting, registering, and deregistering the classes that they provide. The code that does the registration should check that the classes weren't already registered because it is possible for a user to install your secondary add-on as a standalone add-on. If you won't have this code, you might run into classes getting registered multiple times. When testing this, I found out that you might be able to get into a situation where you would break your add-on bundle. And that is when you have a secondary add-on installed as a standalone add-on and bundled with another add-on. Now, if a user decides to disable the secondary add-on, if you don't have any checks in place, the user might break your add-on bundle by deregistering the classes that, that your bundle is using. I actually started a Blender dev forum thread about this particular topic, and I had a great conversation in that thread with Spencer Magnuson, who pointed out some great ideas about using the reload scripts option to help re-register the classes that are missing, or adding a warning in the UI of your add-on, telling the user that some classes are deregistered and that they would probably need to re-enable this add-on. Spencer shared more ideas, but I will only tease them here, and if you're interested, make sure to check out that forum post, and I'll leave a link in the comments. And the final thing I wanted to share with you is the local storage, or your add-on. The Blender devs have provided a standard way for us to get a location where we can store files that are used by our add-on. Now these could be logs, temp files, or something that your add-on needs to download from the internet. And you would want to use that command to create this folder because in some situations the folder where your extension is installed won't be writable. Some things you should keep in mind is the path keyword argument will allow you to create subfolders in that folder for your extension and also when a user uninstalls your extension this folder would be removed. Now that you know how you can transform your legacy add-on into a Blender extension, in this video right here I'll show you some of the common issues that you should watch out for when submitting your add-on to the Blender extensions platform.